Thank, thank you very much, Hoib. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. I still have the feeling that we should offer a chance for those people. How, how many are there standing outside? No, because I, I think if, if you could find four chairs, that'd be space for chairs over there. Does that make sense? Because I, I feel un uneasy with people standing in, in the hallway having to listen to me. I think it's more comfortable, maybe. Okay, you want to, you want to stay there? Yeah. Okay, so I have, I have, a, I have a second. Y y you, know, you know Gustav Mahler, the, the composer? He composed for, for a regular orchestra and then he always had people with the trombones up somewhere on the balconies or outside or something. So I feel a little like that. I have like two, two audiences to speak to. There, there's the corridor audience and the main room audience. <laughs> um, but maybe that's also part of the, part of the re relational challenge here. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for coming in such great numbers. Um, it's particularly... Um, 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 delightful to see so many people who seem to be students or who seem to be under 30. Um, so I hope to be offering something um, to everybody, to those who are in established academic careers, th to those who are studying, who maybe want to become academics, uh, or who are just interested in debates around geography, around urban studies, and around global urbanism and globalization. And if you've come with the expectation to hear some answers, um, especially concerning the question that I pose here, why global uh, urbanism is far from global, then I need to disappoint you. As um, a true and good academic scholar, I'll ask more questions rather than give answers. Um, and the first question I'm going to ask is a question to you. Um, and it's a very simple question. It's a, a classically geographical question, if you like. Please raise your hand if you feel reasonably comfortable telling me what country the city of Vilnius is located in? Leave your smartphones where they are for that tough question. What country is the city called Vilnius located in? Okay, so I see about, well, 10 to 15 percent, perhaps 20 percent of the audience raising their hand. Perhaps the, the gentleman here, what, what's your guess? Lithuania, exactly. So Lithuania, one of the 28 member states of the European Union, the capital of Lithuania. Why do I ask that question? Well, you can see that even in a, in a very educated audience, or audience where the majority studies geography or has an interest in geography, um, that question poses quite some level of difficulty. And that's not only uh, what you now realized, but what the authorities in Vilnius realized uh, when they launched this publicity campaign. Vilnius, the G-spot of Europe, nobody knows where it is, but when you find it, it's amazing. <laughs> if you still don't know where Vilnius is, look at where the ecstatic hand clutches the bed sheet. It's right there. And the link that you find down here, when you click on it, directs you to a website where you can explore what Vilnius has to offer for each of your kinks. <laughs> you can go wild <laughs> in green spots where you can always get behind the bush. You can <laughs> use your tongue. Extraordinary tastes leave you wanting for more. Or you can do it in the dark. The best nightlife spots to do it till the morning. Now, when you click on these links here, things get a little more mundane uh, and they are not of the sleazy sort that this campaign would, um, would make you to expect. So what, happen what hides behind these labels here are parks, um, these are bars, uh, these are nightlife spots and this, these are just uh, places where you can work out. <coughs> but you know when someone is desperate in advertising, when they have to uh, um, take resort to sex cells as a strategy, um, usually through a masculinist gaze, of course, and that's what um, the lady on the previous um, uh, slide also suggested. It's a masculinist gaze, of course, on, on Vilnius. Uh, and the irony here is that the Baltic countries in general have no irony of sex tourism. Um, thanks to Ryanair and EasyJet, um, there are actually many uh, men who fly over for stag nights just, be just before they um, get married for a cheap beer and often cheap women. But Vilnius, uh, this image campaign demonstrates that Vilnius is in a similar position to many cities uh, in Europe and around the globe, where they're one of a great number of cities 
that feel that all the attention in urban tourism goes to a select few cities, goes to Barcelona, goes to Paris, to London, to New York, perhaps. And they want to have a slice, however small, of that expanding share of urban tourism, of prestige, of recognition as well. Um, and this fact that all the attention goes to a few cities and the others are treated a little as footnotes um, or as case studies has become also a bone of contention in urban theory in recent years. Urban theory, the kinds of theories you, you make about cities and the question of what kind of cities count in making global urban theory. Urban theory that is applied around the globe to cities anywhere, whether that's in the United States, whether that's in the Baltic countries, whether that's in Southern Africa or wherever else. And what scholars diagnosed is a similarly marginal position that Vilnius here highlighted in the tourism market. Um, in the market or um, the debates on um, urban theory, in the epistemological landscape of urban theory. This is the challenge, as Ananya Roy formulated it about 10 years ago. She wrote the following, much of the theoretical work on city regions is firmly located in the urban experience of North America and Western Europe. This is not unusual. It is part of a canonical tradition where theory is produced in the crucible of a few great cities, Chicago, New York, Paris, and Los Angeles. Cities inevitably located in Euro-America. It is time to rethink the list of great cities. And now among those great cities that she names, Chicago, New York, Paris, Los Angeles, um, you will recognize, especially those of you who, who study um, urban studies, or urban geography, of course, some cities that, that shaped um, urban theorizing. Um, Chicago with the Chicago School uh, of Urban Sociology. Um, New York, very influential for different kinds of theorizations, in particular also for gentrification. Um, Paris, um, <coughs> in the sense of urban design, often taken as example the um, urban design by Usman. Uh, and Los Angeles more recently uh, in the um, Los Angeles School of Urban Studies. <coughs> it's much harder to think of the paradigmatic contribution of, say, Vilnius to urban theory. What does Vilnius stand for in urban theory? It's never become a model of anything like many other cities in the rest of the world. And so what this resulted in was in a call for cosmopolitan urban theory. Here was uh, by Jennifer Robinson, who saw th the need for a more cosmopolitan form of urban studies that has never been more apparent. Ordinary cities then exist in a world of cities linked through a wide range of circulations of people, ideas, resources, in which cities everywhere operate both to assemble diverse activities and to create new kinds of practices. So she works through the term of ordinary cities um, that you can see here, which is also the title of her book, which appeared in 2006. Um, and she tries to say, well, maybe we should not look to those few iconic examples, <coughs> but we could consider every city as a so source of urban theory, of urban theorizing, um, anywhere in the, in the world. Um, so for her, what we really ne need, and um, that's another quote from one of her um, articles, it's a commitment to producing an understanding of the urban, which is potentially open to experiences of all cities. So, um, what, what is to be done, as Lenin would have asked? How do we get there to this cosmopolitan urban theory? I go back to this article by Nanya Roy. Because in the same article, she continues saying, doing so, so um, rethinking that list of great cities, um, re uh, requires dislocating the Euro-American center of theoretical production. And this part I agree with. I think we need to pluralize the places from which we theorize. That's also was what Jennifer Robinson s says. But I have more difficulty with the second part uh, where she goes on later on the same page. And she says, the center of theory making <coughs> must move to the global south. This um, presented here as a conclusion of the need 
of dislocating the Euro-American center of theoretical production, um, immediately jumps to the global south as um, a way of doing so. Um, and I think th the argument that I'm going to develop is that it has not just become a way of doing so, but increasingly the only way of doing so, of making urban theory more cosmopolitan. And this is the part or the, the criticism from which I start to develop the argument here in this talk. Um, this has become a very influential article, um, and not just in the Journal of Regional Studies, it's one of the most read articles in regional studies, um, but in general, so up to now it's, it's been cited uh, more than 800 times. Um, and it's also influenced other articles. Um, and it's influenced how we think about global urbanism, global urban theory in general. Another influential debate um, is uh, the debate on worlding, worlding cities. Um, so seeing cities in the processes of becoming um, part of the world through diverse circulation of experts, of images and so on. And that debate on worlding has a simil similar short circuit um, where the need to diversify the places from which we theorize is equated to the need to theorize from the global south. And I'll just give you one example of, of a prominent article here on worlding from um, McCann and others, where the right worlding is about new understandings of the political processes, those that exceed and elude the standard formats of social mobilization or subaltern resistance, and instead are complex compositions or assemblages of collusions and subversions in the interstices of global urbanism. So this is a little how they define, how they see worlding. Um, now they go on, and uh, this is the interesting part. Put another way, worlding cities is a conceptual framework for crafting a latitudinal analysis of the urbanism of the global south. So if one wants to, does, uh, wants to do that, um, if you have one wants to look at um, the political processes that exceed and elude the standard formats, um, then what we should do is um, conduct an analysis of the urbanism of the global south. Um, and this theorizing from the South has become very uh, successful and very inspira uh, inspirational so that within um, a little more than 10 years, one can um, claim um, fairly justly that it's become part of the canon of urban theory. Um, so you can see it, for example, in a, in a textbook that appeared three, four years ago, a um, very good textbook, Urban Geography, A Critical Introduction, um, where they write that new patterns of urbanization are unfolding in the global south and we need to study the growing influence on cities in the global north and where there's a whole chapter that's devoted to theorizing from the south um, in this book. And there's a recent succession of different handbooks and readers that focus on theorizing from the south. So um, th I want to highlight three that appeared in, in recent years. Um, the Routledge Handbook on Cities of the Global South, um, the Routledge Companion to Planning in the Global South, um, and the Cities of the Global South reader all appearing uh, in the last couple of years. So you can see that this has enjoyed really a veritable uptake, take a ver veritable um, um, interest. And I just want to be clear, for me, um, I, I very much sympathize with this quest for decentering urban theory, um, for this quest for a cosmopolitan approach, and for me, also, this literature on theorizing from the Global South has been very helpful and very instrumental um, in developing the argument I want to present in the rest of this talk. So for me, theorizing from the Global South is um, a point of departure, um, but I also find that it has its silences. Um, I, it has its silences because in partitioning the world into a North and the South that um, is the binary opposite of the north. Um, it um, ignores certain parts of the world that are neither north nor south. And that is what I've um, chosen to call the, the global east. And so what I want to propose in this talk is there, there is a need not just to theorize from the south, but to also think with the global east. And each of these words here, the thinking, the with, the A global and the East is chosen with care. Um, and I will come back to this in a later part of the talk. Um, why, have, why I have not just named this, we also need to theorize from the global East. But I think we need to think with 
a global East rather than theorize with, uh, theorize from a global East. And I see that not an, as an alternative project, but um, as an additive or cumulative project of um, making urban theory more cosmopolitan, uh, opening it up to the experience of cities everywhere. And when I speak of the East, I refer to all that is not captured by this binary division into North and <coughs> South, all the cities, all the epistemic communities that do not find themselves um, in either the North or, or the South. Um, and Vilnius would be one of the cities and one of those epistemic communities. And I'm basing my argument personally on the research that I've conducted for more than 50 years now in what is often known as the post-socialist or post-Soviet space. Um, so anything that used to be known as the Eastern Bloc, as the area behind the Iron Curtain, um, those cities and countries that straddle very uneasily this border between North and South. And this is a project, thinking with the Global East, a project which I've pursued, uh, a, a, a project um, of thinking um, for a couple of years now. Um, and I call that for myself in search of a Global East. Um, and where what I'm going to speak about today really has a particular place also in a certain genealogy of thought, how, how I've developed my, my own thinking. Um, and so I just want to place the talk today a little in its context, in the context of um, two thought projects that came before and that have been published. Uh, one was called Goodbye Post Socialism, which is going to appear in the next few days online, um, where I, I assess um, the, the value uh, of this theoretical concept of post socialism, anything that comes after socialism. Then an article that's called In Search of uh, the Global East, Thinking Between North and South, uh, where I, tr I try to think the possibility of um, placing an East between North and South and what is the theoretical utility of using the East as a third category. And then this talk kind of comes in, in a third step in a certain sense, um, where um, I apply some of the thoughts I've developed here to the particular situation of global urbanism um, and of uh, the theorizing from the north, north and the south and this drive towards a more cosmopolitan urban theory. And then finally, there, there, there's also um, a fourth one uh, that I've provisionally titled th Three Ways of Thinking with a Global East. Um, so if you ask me today, okay, what exactly does it mean to think with the Global East? What, uh, what, what, what kind of different theoretical approaches, what kind of themes um, could be highlighted un under that context? Then I, I need to say this is still for me work in progress and I'm happy for any kinds of inputs. Um, but for today, I'm really just going to make the argument um, how the Global East um, has become has become erased in a certain sense from this urbanism from the north and from the south. So in, in, in uh, what is going to come, what I really want to unpack is where these silences come from, um, the silences about the east, um, in something that I've called um, a dual grand erasure. And I take this term of grand erasure from um, Raymond Connell, uh, a, very, a very influential academic, Australian academic, um, who uh, puts herself or locates herself in um, this tradition of Southern theory. And what I call dual grand erasure is the fact that the East and its cities are made invisible and insignificant in theorizing global urbanism, both from the North and from the South. And I'll spend a good part of the remainder of this talk corroborating this claim of dual grand erasure by first of all talking about the erasure of the east from the global north. And then I'll, I'll move on to the global south and then I'll, I'll try and make um, some modest proposal what it could mean to think with a global east. Um, in the erasure of the east from the north, it's perhaps worth dwelling on this diagram for a little while. Um, this is probably one of the more famous diagrams of global urbanism. Can, can anybody, does anybody know what, what it shows or where it comes from perhaps? Or who drew, the, who drew the diagram? Who is the author of the diagram? Does it ring a bell with anyone? Yes? 
Uh, yes, exactly. World systems, or rather, world cities theory, um, by John Friedman, um, published in uh, 1986 in an article. And does anybody remember what what he wanted to show with this? What what does this um, this it's not a real map; it's more a cartogram. Uh, what, what does he, what does he want to show with this um, with this diagram? So what he tried to do is to show cities different integration with the world economy. Basically, um, the the larger a city ap appears hi here. Um, the more important it is as a command and control center in the world economy. Um, so you have a, a few uh, big primary cities, um, Tokyo, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, London, Paris. And then you've got a hierarchy of cities, uh, some cities uh, more important, some cities less important. Now he, he calls it a city's integration with the world economy, but I think what he really means is uh, with the capitalist world economy. Because in 1986, there was also a world economy that spanned the world, but which was not capitalist, it was socialist. Um, and that is only hinted to in th this marginal mention of the Soviet Union here. Um, it's also mentioned in a short footnote in his article, but then it disappears. So what this is really is a, uh, is a capitalocentric reading of the world economy. It focuses on the capitalist world economy. The Soviet Union here ap appears as a case apart, uh, as a case apart, and there's another pr another problem here because between Western Europe and the Soviet Union, of course, there's also Eastern Europe. There was a part of Eastern Europe that was not part of the Soviet Union, which does not figure figure at all here. So certain parts of the world are, are completely forgotten on that map, not not even mapped as as empty spaces as the Soviet Union is. So one would think, okay, with the fall of the Iron Curtain, that would change. Um, countries of the Eastern Bloc um, joined uh, in a capitalist transition to a liberal market economy. Uh, they become in integrated in um, the capitalist world economy. But actually, the cities in those countries continued to be exoticized as special cases, um, which I is what two um, scholars diagnosed looking at cities in, in, in this area for a number of reasons. For one reason, they're still struggling with the socialist legacy. So they're in a way special cases because they're relatively new to um, uh, the market economy. They're often considered as passive objects of global forces. So certainly not in the freedman sense as command and control centers, but it's, it is those cities and places on which global processes are inflicted global restructuring, uh, global crises, um, fin fin financial um, uh, crises, and so on. These are also the cities which are in a catch-up transition towards liberal market economies. So they, uh, they, they are not there yet. They are trying to catch up. And therefore, they're always epicones. They're always um, lagging behind in that transition. And finally, um, they're imitating an ideal of Western modernity, so um, they they are not uh, they don't present uh, a modernity um, in itself, but they are imitators. And these preconceptions or, or these ideas of those cities um, in uh, in urban studies and in the social sciences in general make for those cities to be easily explained with Western concepts. With so there is no need to invent new concepts or to theorize with those cities because anyway, they are catching up, they're imitating, um, and really they're, they're not active agents. Or else they are ir irrelevant because they are anomalies. They are anomalies because they're still, still struggling with the socialist um, legacy here. So the erasure from the urban theory of the North, I would argue, happens through four constitutive dynamics. One dynamic here, is an exclusive geographical imagination. What is co often called the North is really the West. Um, so th with all the ideas about the West um, that is linked to um, modernity, that is linked to liberal democracy, that is linked to market economy. But once the North is imagined as the West, the East 
no longer has a place in that ima imagination of the West because it is, it is the other of the West. There's also a tendency to elide differences, to collapse differences, because the Northern geographical imagination really is one of all cities as knowable in the same way from the same point of view. This is the conceit of Western modernity that had also, has always been criticized um, by scholars um, who advocate a theorizing from the South. The fact that all cases of uh, cities in the world are present empirical variations of the same theories or concepts that can be applied anywhere. The theoretical concern of Northern um, theory tends to be capitalism. I, I made this evident in the case of Friedman. Um, so anything that is not um, a capitalist system has more trouble fitting into um, this paradigm. And there is a selective reading, a selective reading in the sense that Northern urban theory focuses on rich and powerful cities. And for cities like Vilnius and others, uh, whether that's uh, um, cities in Central Asia or in uh, South, South Caucasus, that label of the rich, powerful cities is a difficult one into which they don't fit so easily. So this is the case I want to make for um, this grand erasure that happens um, of the East um, from the global North, from global Northern theory. And I would now like to make the case that a similar kind of erasure happens also when we look at southern theory, southern urban theory. And I'll spend a little more time making that case um, because um, southern theory is presented as very inclusive. Um, and this is one of its, its goals also to be, to be inclusive, um, to be anti-hegemonic. Um, and one would expect for the East to find a place in that kind of theorizing. And what I want to do is look at the theorizing from the Global South by taking it apart into its constituent components, this proposition, um, first focusing on the, global, the notion of the Global South. So mobilizing the Global South as an epistemological category rather than just as a geographical descriptor um, has been a, an academic endeavor um, for quite a while, but in the specific wording as theory from the South since um, at least the early 2000s. And it's not specific to urban studies, and I think that's important to, to emphasize. Um, so there have been books uh, like Theory from the South, Southern Theory, Epistemologies uh, of the South, um, that have appeared between 2007 and 2014. Um, and um, uh, um, one interesting feature of um, all of those authors is also um, that they're all based in the North. Um, but what they do share is um, a, a decolonial drive, decolonial here, here really meaning um, that one needs to overcome um, the, 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 well, in, in a sense, the legacies of post-colonialism and really uh, um, focus on theory, not just urban theory, that is made in the former peripheries. But the geographical imagination of that term South comes with its own problems. Because what it conjures up in conjunction with the North is really a hemispheric imagination, a hemispheric binary. Hemisphere here meaning half sphere. So two half, half spheres, which creates the illusion of an exhaustive geometrical division into two subsets. The South is non-North. You only have, can have two halves of a hemisphere. Um, so when we speak of the South, the illusion is that, well, everything that does not fall into the North must be in the South. But what I'm going to demonstrate is actually that um, the, what I call the East falls outside both the North and the South. Um, so although we have this hemispheric il illusion, there actually is a third part that is not covered by neither North nor South. Um, th this hemispheric division, um, just as a background, comes from um, the so-called Brandt Report um, by former Federal Chancellor of Germany, Willy Brandt, who proposed this division of a rich North and a poor South, um, partly also that was during the Cold War at the beginning of the 1980s, to um, provide an alternative to um, this ideological division between West and East, between capitalist and communis communist. 
And the idea was to ha say, what okay, can we have a rich north and we have a poor south and um, there is a responsibility of the north also towards the south. Sea rising from the south has um, become in a certain sense also the new dominant approach for sea rising from outside the north. And so this model of north and south transposes the three worlds model, the first world, the second world, the third world, which was current during the Cold War, into really a two worlds model, north and south, while erasing the second world. So what hap whatever happened to the second world, the communist countries um, remains in a certain sense a mystery or unaddressed in, in this. Um, it just disappears between the cracks. So um, if we go back to this textbook on urban geography, um, what it says is the following. It used to be the case that urban geographers examined urbanization in these different parts of the world, third world, second world, first world, uh, separately through the lens of categories such as the socialist city or the third world city. Today, however, such categories are being challenged by new patterns of urbanization unfolding in the global south and the growing influence on cities in the global north. So you can see exactly the movement that I described here. You have a three worlds model and you transpose it into a two worlds model with, with the middle world, the second world, kind of falling out of the picture here. The geographical imagination of the south then does not include the east. Um, and that would be another alternative that you could say, okay, the second and third world just merged into the south. Um, but if you look at empirically what countries and cities people refer to when they refer to the global south, it does not include those cities and countries of the former second world. So um, just two examples. Um, first example, this is the upside down book cover of a book that's called The Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South. And I put it upside down because it allows you to better see the map on the cover. And this map is supposed to give an indication of what is covered by this term, the Global South. And what you'll see is that um, it covers um, the traditional post-colonial nations. It also covers Turkey, for example. But it does not cover any of the former um, Eastern Bloc states. And this imagination of the South as being equivalent to the post-colonial states, uh, mostly equivalent, um, is also evident in the Roy article that I already quoted earlier, where she gives examples of what other cities could be included in this list of great cities that need to, needs to be revised. And she says, Shanghai, Cairo, Mumbai, Mexico City, Rio de Janeiro, Dakar, and Johannesburg. Um, so if, if you um, look at where the cities are, if you picture that before your mental eye, then th the cities have been carefully chosen. So sh I don't think she just throws in any city, but they represent uh, the major regions of the world, East Asia, um, middle, the Middle East, South a Asia, Latin America, and Africa, um, both Sub-Saharan Africa and, and South Africa. But there's precisely not a city here of the former second world. And where the notion of the Global South could include at least part of the East, such as when the Global South is reformulated as the poorer cities, which no longer traces its lineage to the Third World. It only um, can include part of the East, really. And one can see that here in the handbooks that I already showed you earlier. Um, the kind of silences um, on uh, the East here, this handbook says much of Eurasia is ignored, so it, it is conscious about um, the silence. And the one on the right hand side says, pragmatic reasons such as a large and varied scholarship in English and urban experiences in African, Asian and Latin American cities have led us to focus on these parts of the world. Um, th th there's also quite a bit of scholarship on cities in the global east. Um, but this is their justification for focusing on these parts, the availability um, of um, scholarly material. And so finally, this definition of the poorer cities, which could include potentially some cities of the East, but not others, because one would have trouble classifying Moscow or Prague or Warsaw or Baku as the poorer cities of the world. 
Um, these cities actually have uh, a significant level of, of wealth um, and, and money. So I focused a little on the global south and the geographic imagination that comes with it. And now I want to focus a little on this preposition from. Um, it's a preposition that nobody ever talks about and that, that seems to be uh, a, little, uh, a, a little insignificant, really, in its choice. But I think it's um, one among many prepositions that could have been chosen here um, and one that comes with certain implications. Because if you look up from in a dictionary, then one definition you'll find, the first most prominent one is that from indicates the point in space at which a journey, motion, or action starts. So it's actually a very spatial preposition. It indicates a point in space where something starts. So a point where movement starts, for example. It's a preposition that suggests, therefore, a certain circumscribed location being somewhere, and perhaps even an origin, or at least a starting point. And this is partly um, uh, consciously chosen this way. Ananya Roy here speaks um, of a politics of location. Um, to speak is to speak from a place of the map. So you're always located. You don't have this disembodied view from nowhere. But it comes also with some um, difficulties and challenges. Partly because the from carries a cert certain territorial connotation that creates insides and outsides. If you're in Vilnius, I don't think you could necessarily claim that you theorize from the south. And it runs counter to ideas of connectedness and globalness, or at least it doesn't lend itself easily to those ideas. Um, and this idea of connectedness is very important to um, this project of theorizing from the global south. Because one of the slogans is that the global south is everywhere. It could be anywhere on, on the, in the world. Um, but here, this preposition from becomes a little problematic. And finally, the theorizing. Um, the theorizing, which um, in the majority of cases means theorizing through and with post-colonialism as an approach, an approach that travels unevenly across the cities of the East. Um, unevenly um, for two reasons. One is that the Global South has become shortened for the world of non-European post-colonial peoples. So the idea that post-colonial is usually linked up with non-European becomes problematic precisely for s such cases such as Vilnius, which are part of the European Union for all intents and purposes located in Europe. Vilnius could be, re could be conceived or analyzed through a post-colonial lens. Um, after all, Lithuania has been colonized several times, um, most recently by the Soviet Union. Um, but of course, it, it has trouble locating itself as a non-European um, city. And the second issue is that this post-colonial lens runs into some difficulties because different cities in the East have a different relationship to it. There's Moscow who for the largest part of several centuries was an imperial metropolis, um, the center of uh, um, the Russian, uh, Russian Empire and then uh, the Soviet Empire, um, but which also is in a sub subaltern relationship in, re in relation to Western Europe, often feeling as inferior to Western Europe. Or you take a city such as Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, which over the course of its history has experienced multiple subordination to different centers. Um, from Moscow during the Soviet period, Istanbul, it used to be a part of the Osmanic Empire. Um, Berlin, which is now the de facto destination for many immigrants. And Brussels, where of course is a member of the European Union, um, much of the politics that affects Sofia as a city um, is made. So what I seek to demonstrate here is that the post-colonial lens might be relevant in certain ways, but might run into trouble uh, or might need to be adapted. So what we see then, I would argue, is an erasure of the East from global urbanism, not just from the North, but also from the South, in the very similar four dynamics here, through an exclusive geographical imagination that tends to equate the South with the Third World. Um, and therefore, the South is no longer equal to the East. 
It elides difference mm -hmm. through this hemispheric binary, binary of north and south, where the south is often posited as the non-north, as everything that is not north, um, ignoring that there are um, parts of the world that are neither north nor south. The theoretical concern is with post-colonialism, which runs into certain difficulties as a theoretical approach once you apply it to um, the East. And the selective reading is a focus on poor and marginal cities. And the cities of the East really fall somewhere between these two. Then neither, most of them are neither very poor nor very marginal, but they are neither very rich nor very powerful. So where does that leave Vilnius? Well, it leaves it doubly erased in a certain sense. Uh, although it's the capital of a member state of the European Union, so ostensibly part of Euro-America, Euro so that the dominant um, entity, it does not have the kind of definitional and epistemological authority that's attributed to the North or to Euro-America. But although it's in a marginal position to the North, it also does not enter the fold of countries in the South Although it might be profitably analyzed post-colonially, it is, of course, European. It is neither particularly poor nor particularly marginalized. So I would argue then that we are in urgent need of the East for global urbanism, if only for the first step of giving some recognition to those cities in the East as having a stake in the academic endeavor of global urbanism, because currently they don't re register on the mental map of global urbanism. And so what I do not, not want to propose is a theorizing from the global east. Instead, what I want to propose is a thinking with a global east. And that is a difference well chosen. And that will be um, the last part of this talk. And I want to talk about e each of those four component parts in, in, in turn, starting with the idea of thinking. Thinking is an emphatic statement for me that wants to underscore that yes, thinking is possible in and with a East, in that part of the world, and that this part of the world can think for itself. And that might sound obvious, but it's not so obvious if you're a scholar in that part of the world. Um, a colleague recently wrote this article, Can the Post-Soviet Think on Coloniality of Knowledge, External Imperial and Double Colonial Difference? And she said the following, the situation can be described as a general invisibility of the post-Soviet space and its social sciences and scientists for the rest of the world, North and South. And the refusal of the global North to accept the post-Soviet scholar in the capacity of a rational subject. So this is what I said earlier about the need for recognition in the first place. And, and so the thinking for me, for me here plays an important part. But it's also important in this thinking to assert some academic authority. So two scholars from Estonia, they write about the difficulties publishing in English. Difficulties go beyond the lack of sufficient language skills. Language is the least of their problems. It seems that these people cannot write, as one editor of a respected academic journal remarked in a private discussion. So this claim to be recognized as a rational subject, as a scholar of value, is an important one. And that's a claim that I want to underline with it, choosing the term thinking. But I also choose it and prefer it over theorizing because it offers an openness um, towards a paradigmatic pluralism. It's agnostic about the theoretical directions that it wants to take, and it also admits multiple knowledges. So it's more open to different forms of knowledge, not all of which is theory. Knowledge can come in different forms, and not all of it needs to take the form of theory. Theory is a particular form of knowledge, and a particular kind of knowledge. And I think by choosing thinking, um, I want to keep some of that openness. Then the preposition with. I choose it in order to provide some sense of being with, of solidarity and valorization, consciously not saying theorizing for, not in a paternalistic stance, and not theorizing from. So you don't need to be located there 
in order to theorize or think with um, the global East. But there's also something else there in this uh, thinking with, the need to engage with the global East, the need to take that part of the world seriously, and that also comes with the need to address hegemonic Anglophone knowledge production <coughs> in a space where English does not travel far. So once you go to do research in Kazakhstan or in Belarus, English won't get you very far, and that spells out a need for working with multiple languages for language skills, a need that increasingly um, cannot be met in the Anglophone academic world because of the need to also produce very quickly academic outputs. Um, and so, in a sense, the East falls out of the circles of academic knowledge production because it is not very legible using English as a language. A global. I choose the small g over the capital G to underscore the global connection that places an interstitial East in the middle of a world thought topologically <coughs> across and along relations connected to multiple elsewheres. So an East that is consciously not erased from the world map, but actually in the middle of it. And then finally, this term East as a term that can, can mean many different things, that is um, polysemic, as one would say. So it's open to different inscriptions, it lends itself to different interpretations. An unstable, uncertain location of the in-between that exposes the, the silences of this hemispheric binary of North and South. So it suggests a geographical imagination that's consciously very different from the binary of North and South. Um, and yes, adding the East is yet another one of those geographical terms that tend to territorialize. But I think we need it as an intermediary step. It aims at multiplying differences rather than effacing those differences. And the current push towards a global urbanism that deserves the name also provides an opening for thinking with a global East. And in so doing, I'm not arguing, arguing for an Eastern urbanism, but I'm arguing for a renewed global urbanism that perhaps could best be described as a more than northern urbanism with a renewed cosmopolitical commitment, the one that's uh, demanded by Jennifer Robinson earlier on, where cities everywhere count, that recognizes the multiple differences within and between north, south, and east, and a more than northern urbanism that eventually abandons strategic essentialisms, such as south, north, and east, towards an engaged pluralism and a comprehensive view of cities anywhere in the world. And in that sense, the global east could become, for global urbanism, what Vilnius wants to become, has become, I don't know, for global tourism. The east spot of global urbanism, nobody knows where it is, but when you find it, it's amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs>